Good morning. How are you guys doing today? All right. You better be awake, man, because it's been a good day and we're excited. And man, it's been a powerful time of worship and teaching and community, man. I'm just glad that you guys are here worshiping with us today. We had a phenomenal first service already, and I know this one is going to be just the same. It already has been. And so I'm excited about what God has in store for us today, for you today. Uh, if it's your first time, again, welcome. We're glad that you're here. You're our VIP. Uh, what I want to uh, share with you today is kind of going along with our whole series, Say What? And this is our third week of the series. Um, and I would encourage you, if, if it's your first time, or maybe it's, uh, you haven't been to the last two weeks of the series, I would encourage you to go on our website, kairos.church, and and go and listen to the last two weeks. Get caught up on what we've been talking about and what we've been discussing. It's been uh, just a great series of, of learning God's Word. Um, but the other thing that's really cool is we've been doing a Facebook Live every Tuesday night at 7.30. Anybody been a part of the Facebook Live? This past week was, was a phenomenal discussion that we had uh, coming off of last week's message. And so I would encourage you um, and to join us uh, on Tuesdays at 7.30. But if you missed them, you can go on our Facebook page and you can go and listen to those and look at the questions and um, we're just having a, an awesome time just continuing our discussion, taking a deeper look at the, the passages of Scripture that we've been going over every single week. So that's what this is all about. We're, we're diving into Scripture, and we're learning about Scripture, and we know um, that in order to get a, a, a better grasp on Scripture, we've we got to take it far beyond just Sunday. It's got to be something that we study every single day and also within community of other people. So I want to encourage you, man, to keep the discussion going. Uh, we have uh, set up our series to do that, we have a place in the back. Uh, after each week, we've set up just some chairs and tables. If you have questions or you want to talk through anything, we have an area back there. Some group leaders will be back there. But then we also have our Talk It Over groups where you just get together, you take your notes, and you kind of share and talk about I mean, what God was speaking to you and what God was speaking to other people, and you just do life together. We already have groups going on, uh, but all of them will be kicking off uh, next week, not this coming week, but the following week on the 27th. All of our groups will be kicking off. We have 10 groups to choose from. You should have received a Connect card. On that Connect card, there was a groups insert where you can see the group, see where they're meeting. And I would encourage you to get involved in community outside of Sunday. Again, keep the discussion growing. We want to grow individually, but we also want to grow together as a church community. So those are just a couple of things I wanted to set up for you. Uh, thank you guys so much for keeping the discussion going. The last two weeks, if you haven't been here, they've been pretty heavy. They've been pretty intense. The topics that we've been talking about um, have kind of been a little controversial and have you know, brought up some great conversation. So this week, I decided, you know what? I'm going to lighten up just a little bit. I'm going to take it down just a little bit. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we are all putrid, wretched sinners. Okay? Sound good? Real light. Going real light with it, y'all. Um, it's going to be great. Um, uh, so he here's, here's the deal. As we, as we get into our Say What Scripture today... What we're going to do is we're going to look at um, uh, really sin today. We're going to talk about the effects of sin in our lives, how we view sin, and then what we got to do to recognize it and deal with it. But this will be kind of part one of a two-week sermon series within the series because I want to talk about sin today, and then I want to follow it up next week and talk about how we as, as Christians are supposed to call other Christians out on their sin. And that is called accountability, right? And we're calling people out and uh, we're keeping them away from sin and not what most people view it as as being judgmental and, and, and a hypocrite. And so I want to talk about the differences there and really get to the bottom of that. But today we're, we're talking about sin. Let's, let's dive into our Say What Scripture. Before we do that, though, let's, let's pray. Let's pray over God's Word. God, today we are thankful for your Word. We're thankful, man, that it is useful to teach us in our lives what is wrong. And, man, help us to, man, just come in line with your Word and with your Son. God, today we know you have something to say to us that you want to teach us. And I pray that we are open to it with our hearts in our minds, God, that you would just, your word would saturate within us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So here we go, Matthew 5, verse 29. You ready? If your right eye causes you to sin, take that joker out and just throw it. Just to see how far, see if you can skip it across a lake, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't say that. That's my own little thing there. But so that's crazy, and it says it's, it's better to lose one part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, if your right hand causes you to sin, just cut that thing off and throw it away too. It's better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. And you're like, whoa, all right, this is some pretty intense stuff. Uh, and this is repeated in Matthew 18, 9. Uh, you can also jump over to Mark and you can kind of see the same thing. If there's something that's causing you to sin, just cut it off. Your arm, your leg, your head. Well, if you cut your head off, you'll be dead. So anyway, probably don't do the head thing. Um, but it's, it's crazy, right? And you're like, what? 
what's going on? This is kind of a serious thing. And so let's, let's dive into that. Let's dive into what Jesus is saying here when he says this to us. And first, we need to know this isn't, Jesus isn't literally saying, hey, if you're sinning, just start cutting body parts off. That's not, he's not saying to go self-mutilate. That's not what he's saying. But what he is getting to is he, he's, he's wanting us to understand the seriousness of sin. And, and the fact that, guess what? In, in this scripture, they didn't know, but he was going to die for it. We now know that he did die for our sin. Sin is serious. You need to know that. And, and you need to understand that Like, if something's causing you to sin, you need to get that out. You need to get rid of it. You need to move past it. Now, in part one of this series... We talked through Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're at today. And we talked about how Jesus didn't come to destroy the law or abolish the law, the, you know, the Old Testament and the prophets and the commands. He didn't come to destroy it. No, he came to fulfill the law. And that's what he was, he was doing in Matthew chapter 5. And then as he goes through Matthew chapter 5, he, he kind of says, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the law to the next level. Because it's not about what you think it's about. He's calling out the religious leaders, right? Because they were really good at this outward display of, of religion, uh, of showing everyone how religious they looked. And he's saying, listen, it's, it's so much more than what you think it is. And as a matter of fact, he says in Matthew 5, verse 20, he says, I tell you that if you are no more obedient than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, if you are no more obedient than the spiritual leaders at this time, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a bold statement because all, all these people are like, well, we're looking up to them. These are our spiritual leaders. And you're telling us right now that if we're not any more obedient than them, then we, we will be in danger of not entering heaven. What are you talking about? It's, it, he's really just laying it on thick. You see, the religious leaders, they possessed the knowledge of the law, right? They looked the part, but, but their hearts were sinful. And Jesus knew that. But they, they put on the show. They, they looked the part. And see, the rest of Matthew 5, Jesus is going in and he's saying, listen, it's not about just looking the part. It's not just about outward obedience. It's, it's about your heart. It's about inward obedience. As you read through and you, you go through Matthew chapter 5, so he, he talks uh, about you know, fulfilling the law and then he, he goes into uh, five or six different commandments and he says, you have heard this in the law, you have heard that it is said, but I'm saying to you now, this is what it really means. And he, he, he does this five or six times. I want to share two with you. Um, they won't be on the screens. It's Matthew 5, uh, 21 and 22, if you want to write it down. He says, you have heard that you must not murder anybody. And anyone who murders another will be judged. But I tell you, if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be judged. So look at that. He's putting murder and being angry with someone in the same, it's the same as murder. It's something that's happening on the inside. Then he goes on, verse 27. He says, you have heard it, it was said. You must not be guilty of adultery. But I tell you that if you look at a woman and want to sin sexually with her, in your mind, you are already done that sin with that woman. And so again, he's, he's taking it to the next level. Saying it's not just about your outward displays. It's not just about this outward obedience. It's what's going on in your heart. You have heard that murder leads to judgment. Well, I'm telling you right now that anger within you leads to the same judgment. You have heard it is said that, that if you don't commit adultery, well, I'm telling you right now, if you look at and want and think that that is adultery, you don't actually have to commit the act. You see, we, we have this external view of, of sin. If we see someone doing it, okay, they're doing it, they're sinning. But we, we don't view sin internally. Jesus does. He's saying, look, you've got to look at the inside. You've got to look at what's going on internally. And, and that's what God says. You know, he, God says that he looks at, at, at a man's heart, and we, we tend to look at the outward appearance. And what all this is saying is that God is viewing our thoughts to be the same as our actions. I want you guys to write this down. Thinking wrong is the same as doing wrong. Thinking wrong is the same as doing wrong, and thinking sin is the same as acting sin. What's going on in here? It's not what you're doing. It's what's going on in here. What's going on with your heart? Thinking sin is the same as acting sin. You know, what we know about Jesus is that he was without sin. We know that. We, we can read through the Bible, and we can, we can see that. He was without sin. And what's so interesting about this is this means that not only did Jesus not sin in his actions— but he also did not sin in his thinking. I don't know about you. For me, that's, that's mind-blowing. Because it's one thing to say, okay, we see that Jesus wasn't acting this way, but what was going on on the inside? Because for you and me, we can say, listen, I probably sin about every 20 minutes, right? Just inside. The things that I'm thinking, 
about other people, the things that I'm, you know, the lustful thoughts that I have or the desires of my heart. I'm just, I'm all the time, just sin, sin, sin going on. I'm like, Jesus, please forgive me. But the Bible says that, that Jesus was without sin, both in action and in thought. And this is a, it's a mind-blowing thing. And what this is all leading to is, is this one simple statement, that the battle against sin takes place long before the physical act of sin. It's going on in here, long before you show anything. James 1, verse 14 and 15, it says, People are tempted when their own evil desires lead them away and trap them. And their desire leads to sin, and the sin grows and it brings death. It's the sin that's growing inside you. You allow it to grow, you let it fester, you keep thinking on those things, and it, it'll, it'll bring death. It'll ultimately come out and it'll bring death. There's just a big difference between how we view sin how Jesus views sin. He, 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 because I think for him, he, he, he knows. He's like, I, I came to do one thing. I came to die for your sin. And, and, and he took the weight of the, of the world's sin upon his shoulders. And so he has, man, this serious view of sin. And he's trying to let these, these men and these women know, listen, this is serious. It's not just about some act, but it's also about your heart. It's about knowing what's in here. He says, you gotta start taking your sin seriously. But I think instead of taking our sin seriously, what we, what we do is we spend a lot of time trying to rationalize our sin. We spend a lot of time trying to prove that our, our sin isn't sin. We try to find loopholes to our sin on accepting our sin and accepting the sin of others. Let me just tell you, Jesus still died for the sin that you are rationalizing. Jesus still died for the sin that you are tolerating. And Jesus still died for the, for the sin that you are being accepting of. He still died for it. That's what, he, that's what he came to do. Cultural majority, this is, this is what I believe, cultural majority chooses feeling and personal preference over biblical truth. That's the reality. Cultural majority. We, we say, this is how I feel. And because this is how I feel, then you have to accept how I feel. Right? God made me feel this way, and so it must be Okay. I, I feel this way, and you have to accept it. And it doesn't matter if our feelings or our thoughts and actions line up with God's word. We just, we rationalize it. We rationalize our beliefs because, you know, well, this is how we feel. This is our circumstance. And what we do as we're doing that is we forget to line up our lives and our thoughts and our actions with God's word. We just say, oh, this is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm feeling. This is how it has to be. But we, we, we don't do it. We don't look to God's word. Actually, what we do is what most people do is they look to God's word to see how far they can go without sinning, right? What, what, how far can I go? How, how much can I get away with? Instead of looking to God's word to say, how, how can I be more holy? How can I be more like Jesus? This is what our kids do, right? You ever told your kid not to do something? What do they go do? Like you, if I was to tell my kid, hey, don't step off that first stair. They'll go stand. As cl- they'll try to get, look, I'm not doing it. They may like put their foot over it. Look at me. <laughs> and they dabble in it, right? And they try to get a little taste and they try to do everything they can to skirt around the one thing that you didn't, you told them not to do. And that's what we do with sin. Well, it says not to do this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna come on this side. I'm gonna do this over here. And it's probably not the same thing. How close to sin can I get without actually sinning? That, that's what we do. So we rationalize. There's two areas. Well, there's a couple of areas where we do this. One of the main ones is, is with sex right? We, we, we know in, in what the Bible says about it. And what we tend to do is we say, okay, it's saying sex, so I can do all these other things, and it's not sex, so I'm good, right? A- another example of this is, is with drugs. I think the biggest one right now is marijuana. Well, it's not cocaine. It's not so bad, and it doesn't really affect me, so I, it's, it's, it's okay. I'm just going to dabble in it. It's not a big deal. It's not causing problems. I don't have an addiction. It's, it's no big deal. Same thing happens with drinking, right? We, we, we take a few drinks, and I'm, I'm not really drinking to get drunk. It's not really affecting me. I'm just dabbling. I know I shouldn't, but I'm, not gonna, I'm, I'm just going to do a little bit. We get as close to it, do as much as we possibly can without actually sinning. Same goes with when we're watching shows and, and movies, right? And we say, well, it's only brief nudity, so it's not really affecting me. I'm not allowing that to saturate within my heart and my mind. I'm not thinking about that later for the next 20 years of my life. As a man, you are. But that's what we do. Well, I'm not watching porn. It's just a, a, you know, just a sex scene in a movie. It's not a big deal. How, how close to sin can I get without actually sinning? And so we debate and we argue. 
right? Is this a sin? You know, in the Bible, it's not really clear. And I heard this one guy this one time this, over there, he said this one thing. So maybe it's not a sin. You know what? It's probably okay. I mean, it's just so, it's so shocking to me how, how quickly we will be okay with something being a sin if someone passionately argues against it being a sin. Be like, yeah, I feel the way they feel. Let's go sin. Woo! Right? It's, 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 it's so amazing to me how quickly we'll be okay with sin if the sin in question affects the lifestyle of someone that we know and love. Right? Because we don't. If we're told that it's a sin and they're living in it, well, we can't say, well, you're, you're living in sin because that's, that's their lifestyle. So, you know, it's probably fine. This is what 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, it says this. It says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear, and they will reject the truth. That's the world we live in today. And I think this is something that's been happening for a long time. But today, guess what? It is happening on this massive scale because you have false teachers and false preachers and, 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 and people who aren't living by the word of God. They're getting on YouTube and they're getting on Facebook and they're saying all these things that is wrong. That does not line up with scripture. But guess what? It's tickling everybody's ears. Yep, that's what I wanted to hear. Now I can keep on living in sin and say I'm a Christian. That's what we want. And this isn't new. This is something that, that has taken place since the very beginning. You go all the way back to the garden, and you will see deception. You will see God, uh, Satan twisting the truth. So God says, Adam and Eve, hey, don't eat from the fruit of the garden of the middle tree. Okay. Satan rolls up, and he's like, yo, is that what God said? And Eve's like, yeah, that's what he said. And he's like, no, 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 no. You won't die. Listen. Listen, you won't die. As a matter of fact, what's going to happen if you do this? If you eat this fruit, it'll be so good, and your eyes will be open, and you will become a god. And it's like, bet, I'm on that, right? Because all of us, that's what we want. We want to be in control. We want to have ultimate control. We want to do whatever we want. And so if I eat this fruit, I'll get to be in control. And as a matter of fact, this fruit looks good. It looks pleasing. It, 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 I, it, what he's saying sounds good. And so, so Eve, take, it's, it's deception. One of the enemy's greatest tactics, one of the things that he wants to do more than anything is he wants you to get to you to believe that God is a liar. And that's what he did with Eve. No, Eve, no, 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 no. That's not what God meant. This is what really will happen. And so what she does, she does it. She goes for it. And she doesn't want to sin alone, so she hands it to her husband, right? That's what we do. Well, I don't want to be the only one doing this, so let's do it together. It'll be great. <laughs> right? That's what he does. It looks good. It looks pleasing. Everyone's doing it. It's okay. So let's just go for it. See, our, our view of sin is so skewed by false teachers, by false doctrine, by people who, who claim to be Jesus followers that say, you know what? In the Bible, this isn't really what God was saying. No, no, no. He's saying this. That's not really a sin. It's going to be okay. And in that moment, what they're doing is they're echoing the same lies that Satan did to Eve back in the garden. It's deception. There's this deception. So I wanted you to understand the seriousness of sin. I wanted you to understand that there's, this, there's a sin uh, going on in your heart. It's not just this outward thing. And then what I want to do is I want to help you recognize it and deal with it. Recognize it and deal with it. Instead of rationalizing, instead of making excuses, instead of accepting your sin, recognize and deal with it on a heart level that's inwardly and also on an outward level, the, the, the doing, the action level. So how do we recognize our sin? I'm going to give you three really simple and quick ways. They're not even on the screen because it's so easy for you to remember. You ready? You want to know how to recognize your sin? It's, it's simple. Know God's word. As a Christ follower, you want to recognize, know his word. It's being in his word every day. I'm telling you what, coming to church once a week, every single week for the year is not enough. It's not. You're called to study this thing. You're called to know this thing on your own in your own daily walk. It's called feeding yourself, right? Know God's word. And then after that, the second thing is to pursue Jesus. And the only way you can pursue Jesus is by knowing this thing, right? Because that's where we learn about his life. And as you pursue Jesus and as you go after Jesus, you'll begin to, man, live the things that Jesus lived and do the things that Jesus did and want to be more like Jesus. So you know God's word and you pursue Jesus. And when you're doing those two things, the Holy Spirit will convict you. And that's when you begin to recognize sin in your life. Know God's word. 
Pursue Jesus. The Holy Spirit will convict. So there you go. We're going we're gonna to recognize our sin that way and do those things daily. So now that we have recognized our sin, what are we supposed to do? How do, we, how do we deal with it, Brent? That's the big thing. I, I want to know, how do I deal with the sin in my life? You ready for this? This is another simple thing. Run from it. Run. And you're like, wait, that doesn't sound, I want to fight this thing, right? No. You run. You don't fight it. You don't try to stand your ground. Let, I, need to, I need you to understand something. You cannot beat your sin. Do you understand? You can't. You can't overcome it. Listen, if it was so easy for you to defeat your sin on your own, why did Jesus have to go to the cross and die in your place? Amen. You can't beat it. You run from it. This is scripturally backed up. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 11. 9 and 10, they list some evil things and talk about some you know, sinful things. Verse 11, it goes on and says, But you, man of God, run away from all those things. Instead, live in the right way. 2 Timothy 2.22 same thing, run away from the evil desires of youth and try hard to live right. You go back to Old Testament, uh, Amos, it's 5.14. It says, do what is good and run from evil so that you will live. It says, run. I've been saying this this whole time. If it's in the Old Testament and echoed in the New Testament, it pertains to our lives. We run. I think we, especially men, I know for me, it's like, I don't want to run. I don't want to seem weak. I don't want to look like I'm scared, Right? I don't want to do that. I want to stand up. I want to fight. I want to do this on my own. I can control this. I can handle this. I can overcome this. No, 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 no. Listen, when it, when it, when it comes to running, here's what I want you to understand. Don't look at it as running from sin. Look at it as running towards Jesus. Amen. That's what you're doing. You're running towards him. Because guess what? He's already defeated your sin. And the closer you are to Jesus, the further you are away from your sin. You run towards him. You pursue him. First Timothy just a, a different translation that I want to share. It says, run from all these evil things. Verse 11, pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says the same thing. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And you're running towards him. You're living your life for him. And yeah, along the way, you're going to get tripped up and you're going to get distracted and sin's going to still happen, but you just keep running towards him and you keep pursuing righteousness. You see, it's only in a pursuit of Jesus that we are made righteous. One of the things we talk about here at Kairos is, is focusing our heart and our mind on Jesus. It's actually our logo. If you've seen our logo, it's a circle, has two arrows. One arrow represents our heart, one arrow represents our mind, and both of those things are pointed toward God and towards Christ. And we want to focus our heart and our mind on Jesus, and we'll be given that peace, that, man, that un, un, just unexplainable peace that surrounds our life. So we focus our heart and we focus our mind on him. We keep our eyes focused on him. And I want you to understand this. this is, I'm not saying focus your actions on Jesus. It's not, it's not about focusing your actions on Jesus. It's, it's, it's focusing your heart and mind on Jesus. Me and the men, we like to accomplish tasks. And I think for the Pharisees, this is the same, right? We, we try to pursue righteousness by uh, accomplishing religious task, but tasks don't make us righteous. Listen, this is so important. Doing good won't get you into heaven. Do you understand? It won't. Pursuing Jesus gets you into heaven. That and only that. And as you pursue Jesus with your heart and with your mind, those tasks that you were setting out to do before, they will naturally happen because of who Jesus is and who you are following. Now, going back to your heart and mind, you, you, you can't have a heart and mind focused on Jesus and a heart and mind focused on sin. These are two things that repel one another. And there's so many Jesus followers that try to live for Jesus and also live in their sin, right? Being of the world. But you can't choose both. You have to choose a side. You have to choose to believe God's word. And every letter of the law that is in it and do your very best to live by it, both inwardly and outwardly. Both inwardly and outwardly. I want to share one passage of scripture with you from 1 John. It's chapter 3. It's verse 4 through 10. And it kind of just sums up everything I, I, I've just been sharing with you. And it says this. It'll be on the screen. The person who sins breaks God's law. Yes, sin is living against God's law. And you know that Christ came to take away sins and that there is no sin in Christ. So anyone who lives in Christ does not go on sinning. 
Anyone who goes on sinning has never really understood Christ and has never known him. Verse 7, dear children, don't let anyone lead you the wrong way. Christ is righteous. So be like Christ. So to be like Christ, a person must do what is right. The devil has been sinning since the beginning. And so anyone who continues to sin belongs to the devil. Kind of just wraps everything we're talking about. The law. Jesus fulfilling the law. Jesus being without sin and, and pursuing him and pursuing righteousness. Can't live in sin and also live for Jesus. It's only as you pursue Jesus that sin will lose its grip on your life. It's not rationalizing it. It's not making excuses for it. It's not pursuing feelings or pursuing traditions or pursuing based off circumstances, whether old or new. It's pursuing the, the sinless, selfless, perfect sacrifice of Jesus and submitting to his lordship in your life. And that is what frees you from your sin. That is what makes you new and nothing else. Church, I'm gonna ask that you would bow your head, close your eyes. I don't know where you're at in your walk. I don't know what your relationship has looked like with Christ. And maybe today you're, you're realizing that you're more sinful than you actually thought you were. You were doing real great at not outwardly sinning, but inside your heart and your thoughts were full of sin. Man, for today, I, I would say this, if that's the truth for you, you can say, I've, I've, I've done a real good job at not showing anyone my sin, but inside, Pastor Brent, I, I, I'm sinful. I would take that to God right now and say, God, today, I lift up the evil desires of my heart, the sinful desires of my heart, all these things that have been leading me astray inwardly, God, and I, I offer them to you and I ask you for forgiveness. And from today, I just, I, I wanna pursue you and I wanna run and flee from those things, not only outwardly, but also inwardly. And I wanna focus on a, on a life in you. Go to God right now and give him that thing. Pursue him, go to him. Maybe today. As 1 John says, so anyone who goes on sinning has never really understood Christ and has never known him. Maybe today you're the person that showed up to church, heard about Jesus, heard about some things and, and, and uh, you know, fulfilling some of these law and commandments and you've done real good at accomplishing tasks and doing things that make you look good outwardly but you never actually gave your life to Jesus Christ. You never actually submitted your heart to him and your life to his lordship. And, and, and you would say today, yeah, I've been doing all these outward things, but on the inside, my heart is sinful. My challenge for you today is to take a step and ask Jesus into your heart. Because it's only when we, we begin to overcome the desires of our heart, the desires of our flesh, that we can begin to live like Jesus did in pursuit of him. What sins are you gonna hand over today? Maybe there is an outward sin that you need to give to him. Whatever it is, take it to his feet and say it. From this day, I'm not gonna try to fight this or stay my ground to this. God, I'm gonna give it to you and I'm gonna run towards you. If you're here today and you say, God, I wanna give my life to you, man, just let go of the things of the past and the sin of the past. You can't st still be living in those things and live for Christ and begin living for him. Take next steps to live for him. Pursue righteousness in your life. God, I lift up our church to you. Whether it's someone here for the first time, second time, or they've been here since the beginning, God, I, I pray for our church that we would be a church, that we would be a body of believers that above everything else, we pursue righteousness and the biblical truth in your word. God, I pray that we wouldn't just see sin and tolerate it or be accepting of it. God, know that we would, man, call each other out on it so that we can continue to pursue you with all of who we are. God, I thank you for your word and that it's just so convicting in my life that it allows me to be a, a better follower of you. But more than that, it allows me to be a better friend, a better husband, a better father. God, it just allows me to be more like Jesus to everyone I come in contact with. God, and that today is what I want for everyone that is hearing this message. God, I lift all these things up to you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Amen.